Chapter One of Freaks on the Fells Three Months Rustication Story Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Freaks on the Fells Three Months Rustication Story Three by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter One Papers from Norway. Norway, second July, eighteen sixty eight happening to be in norway just now and believing that young people feel an interest in the land of the old sea kings i send you a short account of my experiences up to this date i verily believe that there is nothing in the wide world comparable to this island coast of norway at this moment we are steaming through a region which the fairies might rejoice to inhabit indeed the fact that there are no fairies here goes far to prove that there are none anywhere what a thought no fairies why all the romance of childhood would be swept away at one fell blow if i were to admit the idea that there are no fairies perish the matter-of-fact thought let me rather conclude that for some weighty though unknown reason the fairies have resolved to leave this island world uninhabited fortune favours me i have just come on deck after two days voyage across the german ocean to find myself in the midst of innumerable islands a dead calm so dead that it seems impossible that it should ever come alive again and scenery so wild so gorgeous that one ceases to wonder where the vikings of old got their fire their romance their enterprise and their indomitable pluck it is warm too and brilliantly sunny on gazing at these tall grey rocks with the bright green patches here and there and an occasional red-tiled hut one almost expects to see a fleet of daring rovers dash out of a sequestered bay with their long yellow hair and big blue eyes and broad shoulders not to mention broadswords and ring-mail and battle-axes but one does not always see what one expects the days of the sea-kings are gone by and at this moment rowing out of one of these same sequestered bays comes the boat of a custom-house officer yes there is no doubt whatever about it there he comes a plain-looking unromantic man in a foraging cap with a blue surtout and brass buttons about as like to a sea-king as a man of war is to a muffin of course the scenery is indescribable no scenery is describable in order that my reader may judge of the truth of this statement i append the following description there are islands round us of every shape and size all of them more or less barren the greater part of their surfaces being exposed grey rock here and there may be seen as i have already hinted small patches of bright green and sparsely scattered everywhere are little red-roofed wooden cottages poor enough things most of them others gaudy-looking affairs with gable ends white faces and windows bordered with green all of these are while i write reflected in the water as in a mirror for there is not a breath of wind over the islands on my left are seen more islands extending out to sea on the right tower up the blue hills of the interior of old norway and although the weather is excessively hot many of these are covered with snow everything is light and transparent and thin and blue and glassy and fairy-like and magically beautiful and altogether delightful there have you made much of all that good reader if you have be thankful for as i set out by saying description of scenery at least to any good purpose is impossible the description of a man however is quite another thing here is our pilot he is a rugged man with fair hair and a yellow face and a clay-coloured chin and a red nose he is small in stature and thin insignificant in appearance deeply miserable in aspect his garments are black glazed oiled cloth from head to foot and immensely too large for him especially the waistcoat which is double-breasted and seems to feel that his trousers are not a sufficient covering for such a pair of brittle-looking legs for it extends at least halfway down to his knees the flap of his sou'wester also comes halfway down his back he is a wonderful object to look upon yet he has the audacity so it seems to me to take us in charge and our captain has the full hardiness to allow him if one goes out of the beaten tracks of routes in norway one is apt to get into difficulties of a minor kind i happen to be travelling just now with a party of four friends of whom three are ladies the fourth a jolly young fellow fresh from college a few days ago we had a few unusual experiences even for norway 
on leaving bergen we had made up our minds as the steamer did not sail to within about sixty miles of our destination to get ourselves and our luggage put down at a small hamlet at the mouth of the nordfjord and there engage two large boats to transport us the remaining sixty miles up the fjord the ladies of our party valorously resolved to set up all night to see the magnificent island scenery through which we were passing under the influence of the charming and subdued daylight of midnight for there is no night here just now as for myself being an old traveller i have become aware that sleep is essential to a comfortable and useful existence i therefore bade my friends good-night took a farewell look at the bright sky and the islands and the sleeping sea and went below to bed next day we spent steaming along the island coast at one o'clock on the following morning we reached moldeoen where the steamer landed us on a rock on which were a few acres of grass and half a dozen wooden houses we had a good deal of luggage with us also some casks cases and barrels of provisions and a pianoforte as our place of sojourn is somewhat out of the way and far removed from civilized markets a few poverty-stricken natives stood on the rude stone pier as we landed and slowly assisted us to unload at the time i conceived that the idiotical expression of their countenances was the result of being roused at untimely hours but our subsequent experience led me to change my mind in regard to this in half an hour the steamer puffed away into the mysterious depths of one of the dark blue fjords and we were left on a desolate island like robinson crusoe with our worldly goods around us most of the natives we found so stupid that they could not understand our excellent norse one fellow in particular might as well have been a piece of mahogany as a man he stood looking at me with stolid imbecility while i was talking to him and made no reply when i had done in fact the motion of his eyes as he looked at me alone betrayed the fact that he was flesh and blood we soon found that two boats were not to be had that almost all the men of the place were away deep-sea fishing and would not be back for many hours and that when they did come back they would be so tired as to require at least half a day's rest ere they could undertake so long a journey with us however they sent a man off in a boat to search for as many boatmen as could be found he was away an hour during this period the few inhabitants who had turned out to see the steamer disappeared and we were left alone on the beach there was no inn here no one cared for us every place seemed dirty with the exception of one house which had a very lonely and deserted aspect so we did not venture to disturb it in the course of time the messenger returned no men were to be found except three this was not a sufficient crew for even one large boat we required two a feeling that we were homeless wanderers came over us now and each seating himself or herself on a box or a portmanteau began to meditate seeing this the three men coolly lay down to rest in the bow of their boat and drawing a sail over them were quickly sound asleep the act suggested the idea that we could not do better so we placed two portmanteaus end to end and thus made a couch about six feet long a box somewhat higher placed at one end served for a pillow and on this one of the ladies lay down flat on her back of course that being the only possible position under the circumstances a shawl was thrown over her and she went to sleep like an effigy on a tombstone another of the ladies tried a similar couch but as boxes of equal height could not be found her position was not enviable the third lady preferred an uneasy posture among the ribs and cordage of the boat and i lay down on the paving stones of the quay having found from experience that in the matter of beds flatness is the most indispensable of qualities while hardness is not so awful as one might suppose where my comrade the collegian went to i know not presently one of the ladies got up and said that this would never do that the next day was sunday and that we were in duty bound to do our best to reach the end of our journey on saturday night thus admonished my comrade and i started up and resolved to become men that is to act as boatmen no sooner said than done we roused the three sleepers embarked the most important half of our luggage left the other half in charge of the native with the idiotic countenance with directions to take care of it and have it forwarded as soon as possible and at a little after two in the morning pulled vigorously away from the inhospitable shores of moldeoen we started on our sixty miles journey hopefully and went on our way for an hour or so with spirit but when two hours had elapsed my companion and i began to feel the effects of rowing with unaccustomed muscles rather severely and gazed with envy at the three ladies who lay coiled up in an indescribable heap of shawls and crinolines in the stern of the boat 
sound asleep. They needed sleep, poor things, not having rested for two days and two nights. But my poor friend was more to be pitied than they. Having scorned to follow my example and take rest when he could get the chance, he now found himself unexpectedly called on to do the work of a man when he could not keep his eyes open. When our third hour began, I saw that he was fast asleep at the oar, lifting it indeed and dipping it in proper time, but without pulling the weight of an ounce upon it. I therefore took it from him, and told him to take half an hour's nap, when I would wake him up, and expect him to take the oars and give me a rest. On being relieved, he dropped his head on a sugar cask, and was sound asleep in two minutes. I now felt drearily dismal. I began to realize the fact that we had actually pledged ourselves to work without intermission for the next eighteen or twenty hours, of which two only had run, and I felt sensations akin to what must have been those of the galley slaves of old. In the midst of many deep thoughts and cogitations, during that silent morning hour, when all were asleep around me save the three mechanical-looking boatmen, and when the only sounds that met my ears were the dip of the oars and the deep breathing, to give it no other name, of the slumberers, in the midst of many deep thoughts, I say I came to the conclusion that in my present circumstances the worst thing I could do was to think. I remembered the fable of the pendulum that became so horrified at the thought of the number of ticks it had to perform in a lengthened period of time that it stopped in despair, and I determined to shut down my intellect. Soon after, my shoulders began to ache, and in process of time I felt a sensation about the small of my back that induced the alarming belief that the spinal marrow was boiling. Presently my wrists became cramped, and I felt a strong inclination to pitch the oars overboard, lie down in the bottom of the boat, and howl. But feeling that this would be unmanly, I restrained myself. Just then my companion in sorrow began to snore, so I awoke him, and, giving him the oars, went to sleep. From this period everything in the history of that remarkable day became unconnected, hazy, and confusing. I became to some extent mechanical in my thoughts and actions. I rode and rested, and rode again. I ate and sang, and even laughed. My comrade did the same, like a true Briton, for he was game to the backbone. But the one great, grand, never-changing idea in the day was, pull, pull, pull. We had hoped during the course of that day to procure assistance, but we were unsuccessful. We passed a number of fishermen's huts, but none of the men would consent to embark with us. At last, late that night, we reached a small farm about two-thirds of the way of the fjord, where we succeeded in procuring another large boat with a crew of five men. Here also we obtained a cup of coffee, and while we were awaiting the arrival of the boat, I lay down on the pier and had a short nap. None but those who have toiled for it can fully appreciate the blessings of repose. It was a clear, calm night when we resumed our boat journey. The soft daylight threw a species of magical effect over the great mountains and the glassy fjord, as we rowed away with steady and vigorous strokes, and I lay down in the bow of the boat to sleep. The end of the mast squeezed my shoulder, the edge of a cask of beef well nigh stove in my ribs, the corner of a box bored a hole in the nape of my neck. Yet I went off like one of the famed seven sleepers, and my friend, though stretched out beside me in similarly unpropitious circumstances, began to snore in less than five minutes after he had laid down. The last sounds I heard before falling into a state of oblivion were the voices of our fair companions joining in that most beautiful of our sacred melodies, the evening hymn, ere they lay down to rest in the stern of the boat. Next morning at nine, we arrived at the top of the fjord, and at the end, for a time at least, of our journeying. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Freaks on the Fells, Three Months Rustication, Story three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Freaks on the Fells, Three Months' Rustication, Story 3, by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 2. Salmon Fishing Extraordinary. Norway, 14th July, 1868. Yesterday was a peculiar day in my experience of salmon fishing in Norway. The day was dull when I set out for the river, seven miles distant, in a small boat, with a Norseman. A seven miles pool was not a good beginning to a day's salmon fishing, the weight of my rod being quite sufficient to try the arms without that, but there was no help for it. 
Arrived there, I got a native named Anders to carry the bag and gaff. Anders is a fair youth, addicted to going about with his mouth open, with a mild countenance and a turned-up nose. "'Good weather for fishing, Anders,' said I, in Norse. "'Yeah,' said he. "'May get good.' "'Very good.' This was the extent of our conversation at that time, for we came suddenly on the first pool in the river, and I soon perceived that, although the weather was good enough, the river was so flooded as to be scarcely fishable. And now began a series of petty misfortunes that gradually reduced me to a state of misery which was destined to continue throughout the greater part of that day. But hope told me flattering tales, not to say stories, for a considerable time, and it was not until I had fished the third pool without seeing a fin that my heart began fairly to sink. The day, too, had changed from a cloudy to a rainy one, and Anders' nose began to droop, while his face elongated visibly. Feeling much depressed, I sat down on a wet stone in my wet garments, and lunched off a moist biscuit, a piece of tongue, and a lump of cheese. This was consoling as far as it went, but it did not go far. The misty clouds obliterated the mountains, the rain drizzled from the skies, percolated through the brim of my hat, trickled down my nose, and dropped upon my luncheon. "'Now we shall go to the river, Anders,' said I. Anders assented, as he would have done had I proposed going down the river, or across the river, or anywhere in the wide world, for, as I said it in English, he did not understand me. Evidently he did not care whether he understood me or not. Up the river we went, to the best pool in it. The place was a torrent, unfishable, so deep that I could not wade in far enough to cast over the spot where fish are wont to lie. In making a desperate effort to get far in, I went over the boot-top, and my legs and feet, which hitherto had been dry, had immediate cause to sympathize with the rest of my person. Anders' face became longer than ever. All the best pools in the river were tried, but without success, and at last, towards evening, we turned to retrace our steps down the valley. On the way I took another cast into the best pool, going deeper than the waist into the water in order to cast over the right spot. The effort was rewarded. I hooked a fish and made for the bank as fast as possible. My legs were like solid pillars or enormous sausages, by reason of the long boots being full to bursting with water. To walk was difficult, to run in the event of the fish requiring me to do so, impossible. I therefore lay down on the bank and tossed both legs in the air to let the water run out, holding on to the fish the while. The water did run out, it did more, it ran right along my backbone to the nape of my neck, completing the saturation which the rain had hitherto failed to accomplish. But I had hooked the fish and hated it not. He was a small one, only ten pounds, so we got him out quickly and without much trouble. Yet this is not always the case. Little fish are often the most obstreperous and the most troublesome. It was only last week that I hooked and landed a twenty-eight pound salmon, and he did not give me half the trouble that I experienced from one which I caught yesterday. Well, having bagged him, we proceeded on our homeward way, Anders' face shortening visibly and his nose rising, while my own spirits began to improve. At another pool I tried again, and almost at the first cast hooked an eighteen-pounder, which Anders gaffed after about twenty minutes' play. We felt quite jolly now, although it rained harder than ever, and we went on our way rejoicing, Anders' countenance reduced to its naturally short proportions. Presently we came to an old weir, or erection for catching fish as they ascend the river, where it lies one of our favourite pools. The water was running down it like a mill-race. Pent up by the artificial dike, the whole river in this place gushes down in a turbulent rapid. There was one comparatively smooth bit of water, which looked unpromising enough, but, being in hopeful spirits now, I resolved on a final cast. About the third cast, a small trout rose at the fly. The greedy little monsters have a tendency to do this. Many a small trout have I hooked with a salmon fly as large as its own head. Before I could draw the line to cast again, the usual heavy wobble of a salmon occurred near the fly. It was followed by the whir of the reel as the line flew out like lightning, sawing right through the skin of my fingers, which, by the way, are now so seamed and scarred that writing is neither so easy nor so pleasant as it used to be. The burst that now ensued was sudden and tremendous. The salmon flashed across the pool, then up the pool, then down the pool. It was evidently bent on mischief. My heart misgave me, for the place is a bad one, 
all full of stumps and stones with the furious rapid before mentioned just below and the rough unsteady stones of the old dyke as an uncertain pathway to gallop over should the fish go down the river i held on stoutly for a few seconds as he neared the head of the rapid but there is a limit to the endurance of rods and tackle what made the matter worse was that the dyke on which she stood terminated in a small island to get from which to the shore necessitated swimming and if he should go down the big rapid there was little chance of his stopping until he should reach the foot of it far below this island all at once he turned tail and went down head first i let the line fly now keeping my fingers well clear of it he's off anders i shouted as i took to my heels at full speed hurroo yelled the norseman flying after me with the gaff how i managed to keep my footing in the rush over the broken dyke i know not it is a marvel to me the bushes on the island overhung the water the earth having been cut away by the force of the rapid i tried to pull up because they were too thick to crash through but the fish willed it otherwise the line was getting low on the reel the rod bent double presently i had to straighten it out in another moment i was in the water over the boots which filled of course in a moment but this did not impede me as long as i was in deep water i was forsaken at this point by anders who sought and found a safe passage to the mainland where he stood gazing at me with his eyes blazing and his mouth wide open i soon reached the end of the island to my horror for i had not previously taken particular note of the formation of the land there a gulf of water of five or six yards broad of unknown depth lay between me and that shore by which in the natural course of things i should have followed my fish as far as he chose the rapid itself looked less tremendous than this deep black hole i hesitated but the salmon did not still down he went now then thought i hole or rapid the question was settled for me for before i could decide i was hauled into the rapid no doubt i was a more than half-witting captive anyhow willing or not willing down i went ah what a moment of ease and relief from exertion was that when i went a little deeper than the waist and found myself borne pleasantly along on tiptoe as light as one of those beautiful balls with which juveniles in these highly favoured days are wont to sport in the fields and oh ho, ho, how my spirit seemed to gush out through my mouth and nose or out at the top of my head when the cold water encircled my neck as i lost my footing altogether and struck out with my right hand endeavouring the while to support my rod in the left i heard anders gasp at this point but i saw him not in another second my knees came into violent contact with the rock alas every motion of my body as i now write reminds me painfully of that crash immediately after this i was sprawling up the bank having handed the rod to anders to hold while i tossed my legs again in the air to get rid of the water which weighed me down like lead how earnestly i wished that i could tear these boots off and fling them away but there was no time for that on regaining my legs i seized the rod and found that the salmon had brought up in an eddy created by the tail of the gravel bank in the centre of the river between two rapids good i gasped blandly Ander smiled presently i found that it was the reverse of good for when i tried to wind in the line and move the fish i perceived that the resistance offered was not like that of a salmon but a stump i do believe he's gone i exclaimed anders became grave no fish there said i gloomily anders face elongated he has wound a line round a stump and broken off said i in despair woe of the deepest profundity was depicted on anders visage for a full five minutes i tried every imaginable device short of breaking the rod to clear the line in vain then i gave the rod to anders to hold and taking the gaff with me i went sulkily up the river and again taking to the water made my way to the head of the gravel bank over which i walked slowly oppressed in spirit and weighed down by those abominable boots which had once more failed to overflowing waterproof boots are worse than useless for this sort of work but happily this is not the usual style of thing that one experiences in norwegian fishing it is only occasionally that one enjoys a treat of the kind in the middle of the gravel bank the water was only three inches deep so i lay down on my back and once again elevating my ponderous legs in the air allowed a cataract of water to flow over me somewhat lightened i advanced into the hole it was deeper than i thought i was up to the middle in a moment and sighed as i thought of the boots 
fall again before i reached the line the water was up to my shoulders but it was the still water of the eddy i soon caught the line and found that it was round a stump as i had feared with a heavy heart i eased it off when lo a tug sent an electric shock through my benumbed body and i saw the salmon not three yards off at the bottom of the pool he also saw me and darting in terror from side to side bound the line round me i passed it over my head however and was about to let it go to allow anders to play it out and finish the work when the thought occurred that i might play it myself by running the line through my fingers when he should pull and hauling in when he should stop i tried this successfully in half a minute more i drew him to within a yard of my side gaffed him near the tail and carried him up the gravel bank under my arm he was not a large fish after all only thirteen pounds nevertheless had he been fresh it would have been scarcely possible for me to hold his strong slippery body even when exhausted he gave me some trouble gaining the shallowest part of the bank i fell on my knees cramped the fingers of my left hand into his mouth and gills and held him down while i terminated his career with a stone thereafter i fixed the hook more securely in his jaw and launching him into the rapid left anders to haul him out while i made the best of my way to the shore this is about the roughest experience i have yet had of salmon fishing in norway the season this year bids fair to be a pretty good one i have had about twelve days fishing and have caught sixteen fish weighing together two hundred and seventy six pounds two of them being twenty eight pounders end of chapter two end of freaks on the fells three months rustication story three by r m ballantyne